Stocks see a good shade of green with advances far outnumbering the decliners in today's trading session. Energy industrials lead gains while FMCG and consumer durables lag. As to DMC's a trade of about 10% of its equity for over 2,000 crores with Olympus Capital Asia being the likely seller while about 7.4% of CDSL's equity changes hands in a trade of over 1,200 crores on likely selling by Standard Chartered Bank. The Consumer Affairs Secretary tells CNBC TV18 that about a third of all consumer cases relate to insurance, adds that the norm of minimum 24-hour hospitalization for claims is under review, as are surrogate advertising practices of tobacco and liquor players. Cocoa prices leap to a record $10,000 per ton on the biggest supply deficit in 60 years following damaged crops and poor harvest, the tiny bean used to make chocolates is now pricier than most industrial metals. Hello and welcome to Halftime Report on CNBC TV 18. I'm Ekta Batra and with me is Manglam Malu. Well, Manglam, I know you're thinking about the cocoa beans, aren't you? <laughs> Everyone is. I mean, the tiny beans which is more precious than some of the most industrial metals, etc. as well. But the kind of happiness that a tiny bean of chocolate gives you is priceless. So I guess uh, we may have to pay a little more for our little bar, bar of joy. Yes, absolutely. I think uh, definitely we could probably see prices increase. There was a there was a point in time where Nutella also was in shortage on account of one of these uh, shortages. So it's That's real, because of the Russia-Ukraine uh, war Russia, and, Ukraine and all war. that not absolutely. coming there too. Uh, so definitely that is something that we'll monitor but it is <laughs> definitely a sweet day you'd have to say for the markets as well. So we have the Nifty which is up around 0.7%. We have the mid caps which are managing to outperform and which are managing to gain for the second day in a Rose, so up around six tenths of percent, and what stands out is that the advanced decline ratio is positive today as compared to negative yesterday. So that's definitely a positive. Let's see whether this sustains. As of now, the setup looks good. The well, setup looks good. In fact, a lot of stocks are moving well, and uh, some of them actually doing uh, the most of heavy lifting. The Nifty is meandering around that 20-day moving average. Uh, 22, 162 is where the moving average is, and uh, we have the Nifty at <coughs> 22, 170, entirely led higher by Reliance and a couple of these other names as well. The second half of trade more crucial because we'll have the Nifty Bank weekly, uh, rather monthly expiry play out today as well. A uh, bunch of these mid-caps doing well. <coughs> Indian hotels has spiked to the high point of trade. We're seeing decent gains come by on names like Metropolis Health, ABB India and Siemens too. But from the broader markets, a couple of these wealth management names have uh, spiked. So Nuwama Wealth Management is something that should come up for you on uh, the screen, up 14%. And most of the gains have accrued in just the last 20 minutes or so. So uh, the stock uh, virtually at a fresh record high post listing, uh, post the demerger, that entire exercise from Edelweiss to Nuvama and now has moved to a record high. Arvind Smart Spaces is the other one. So we're seeing some comeback in the real estate space as well. And then we have J. Kumar Infra and Zagil Prefade, which have uh, resumed their up move after the decline that we've seen during the decline that we saw in all the mid-cap stocks. But... We do have CDSL and Aster DM Healthcare, both under pressure after big block deals. Vivek joins in with uh, more data on these large trades. Vivek. Well, that's right. You know, we had highlighted this earlier today, you know, prior to market open, that there could be large trades handling both in CDSL as well as Aster DM along expected lines. You know, you did see the big blocks take place. Uh, CDSL, 7.4% of the total equity changed hands. Uh, and, you know, as for the term sheet that we accessed last evening, uh, Standard Chartered Bank, the corporate banking, uh, sold almost their entire stake that they had in the company at 1,672 rupees a share. That was the base price. So at that base price, the total block deal size was a little over $150 million. So with that, Standard Chartered Bank now no longer holds any stake as far as CDSL is concerned. So a bit of overhang gone over there, but the stock continues to remain under pressure given the discount and the large supply that we saw. Now, coming to Astra DM, very interesting deal took place in this particular uh, stock as well. 9.8% uh, of the total equity changed hands. You know, we had highlighted this uh, yesterday too. Uh, now, as per the term sheet, Olympus Capital uh, sold almost 9.8% 
out of the total 18.96 percent stake that they held in the company. A uh, very interesting timing given the fact that uh, you know this comes on the back of the fact that the company has seen a significant uh, strategic divestment of the GCC business as well. Uh, when you're talking about this particular block deal, the offer price range was between 400 to 432. So calculated as the lower end of the price band, this particular deal size was a little over 1950 crores. So again, this particular stock too continues to remain under pressure after the large block. Okay, all right, Vivek. Thanks very much for that. Well, uh, we have Param Desai, who's the pharma analyst at Pravudas Leela. They're joining in to discuss the entire hospital space, including Aster DM, which is down around 7 odd percent. Uh, well, Param, hi, welcome to the show. Uh, Aster DM, now that uh, you know the likely sellers, Olympus, uh, they've probably exited entirely from Aster DM. Uh, how would you read that piece of news? Yeah, if you see uh, uh, the in the recent last 12 to 18 months, we have seen a lot of private equity guys uh, who have invested in the past have basically exited. And there has been equal amount of interest uh, from the domestic as well as the FIs to participate in the space. So this is also one of the bin case and uh, we have seen the entire block been getting subscribed. So so uh, uh, positive from a, from a space perspective. Uh, as, as I said, in the, in the, in the recent past, uh, we have seen series of uh, PE guys existing and but at the same time, a lot of domestic mutual funds and as well as the FIs are being participating in the space. Okay. All right. So that's an Aster DM. But how would you now probably look at the business on a fundamental basis, considering that it has the pure play India business, uh, which investors would now be looking at? Right. So, uh, uh, as you rightly said, uh, they have exited uh, the GCC part of the business. So now the complete focus will be on the India business. And in the last two, three years, the India business have really scaled up uh, pretty well uh, from almost uh, 300 crore kind of a bit 200. Now, I think they should be closing in based on our numbers around 600 crore plus. And given that they are also been like other hospital uh, listed hospital companies, they are also been expanding and they also intend to add another 1700 beds in the next uh, three to four years. Uh, they have been also been taking steps uh, to improve the margins from the current level of 20 percent. So the growth levers are pretty much in, in, intact uh, for Astridium. We remain very constructive uh, at this price point and we see around 18 to 20 percent kind of EBITDA growth in the name in the next uh, say two to three years. Well, you're pretty constructive on all the other names as well. Uh, you know, your picks are up uh, for our viewers on the screen. There is Apollo Hospitals, there is Jupiter Life, there is Max as well, a bunch of them. Um, at these prices and a lot of these stocks already having seen a run up, do you see further room for growth here in the very near to medium term or these are all long term bets that everyone's looking at in terms of industry consolidation and under penetration and all of that, the thesis that people talk about when they do speak about the hospital space? Right. If you see the space uh, had gone into a capex uh, cycle between say 16 to 18 and benefit of that was visible between 2022 or last two, three years, most of these guys have not, uh, companies have not done any capex, uh, or have not added any beds uh, largely. But now as, as I speak, uh, most of these uh, hospital companies are now into new capex cycle. But the good part is uh, the capex which has been coming up is not entirely greenfield. They are, it's a combination of a greenfield, uh, brownfield and some of the inorganic uh, acquisitions also uh, most of the hospital guys have been aggressive. So the next say, three to five years, if I take an horizon, all these companies, most of these hospital companies are doubling their capacity and that would be one of the major driver uh, of the growth. So we, we are positive, as I said, uh, last two years, the growth has been pretty strong and we see the growth momentum to continue uh, on the back of the addition of the new bed addition, what these uh, companies have been doing. Okay. <clears throat> Well, uh, you know, a couple of these hospital stocks are down today, Param. You know, Apollo is down around a percent and a half. We have Max, which is under pressure slightly as well in today's trade. Um, you know, the government is probably the, the date to respond to the Supreme Court with regards to the pricing scenario, which was brought up around a month ago by the Supreme Court, is nearing. Uh, what is your sense in terms of what could probably play out for these private hospitals? when it comes to this issue of standardization of rates? So, uh, uh, realistically, it's very difficult to standardize the rates as there are a lot of complexity and a lot of variables are involved among the, um, the private hospital companies. The quality of services differ, the kind of uh, services they offer, they differ. Uh, so, it will be difficult to standardize the rate uh, uh, across, across the deal. So, uh, in our assessment, it's realistically, it's uh, very difficult to implement uh, standardization of the rates 
in the past also we have seen a couple of states been uh, uh, getting uh, uh, trying to implement uh, uh, such such rates and it was uh, they couldn't do so and as i said the private market, private hospital companies do enjoy 60 65% of the market share mm-hmm. so it would be difficult to 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 have the standardization of the rates so now the department of health needs to uh, get back to the reply uh, to the supreme court within in the next say, two to three weeks of time so we could hear some kind of news flow uh, back and forth uh, and there could be some volatility uh, uh, with respect to that uh, but uh, uh, realistically we 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 see the standard uh, ration of the rates is not a, a feasible solution All right standardization of rates is not a feasible solution uh, which among the other players are all best placed uh, there is some supply that has come in from astrdm any others that you expect would you know give you larger chunks in terms of uh, market supply going forward uh, so honestly uh, in the last 12 to 18 months we have seen most of the pe guys uh, have exited the the hospital names so barring one or two names i think uh, there are not not much any pe guys still still invested uh, in the hospital uh, thing so in that sense i think the supply will be limited to that extent barring said to couple of names so does that mean that uh, lack of supply would uh, cause abnormally high gains in all the hospital space now going forward uh, yeah so there could be near term there could be some consolidation we may see in the space given the recent news from the supreme court all this sir but from a numbers perspective we do see around 15% plus ebitda growth for the next 2 3 years it's pretty much sustainable in nature and as i said one of the key drivers is the new bed addition what they are doing plus the 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 the, the, the demand scenario of the mac the tailwinds continues to be there in the space the lack of infrastructure and in the kind of insurance penetration has been going up i think the 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 absorption of the new bed addition we remain very constructive okay just quickly if in case uh, there is you know a sort of price uh, control which comes through we don't know if it's going to be extreme we don't know if it's going to be moderate or mild at this point how much do you think stocks could probably correct if in case it's a mild price control moderate price control and maybe even an extreme and which company or which hospital do you think is likely to be most impacted on account of its peer profile if you see 50 to 60% uh, 60% of the payer mix is generally comes from the cash plus international where you have the kind of pricing power that the hospital companies do have in their hands so if if there is a restriction or if there is a restrictiveness in terms of pricing power then your 50 to 60% of your of your businesses for most of the hospital companies will get impacted depending upon what kind of uh, uh, say, uh, the standardization of rates of this thing gets implemented to to that extent yes if if the if it's pretty severe in nature it would be negative and it could have impact the multiple also across the names the it, it's not that one or two company will it's across the space the the impact will be there if if the severity is on a higher side all right thanks a lot param for joining in giving us your view on the entire hospital space uh, constructive on a bunch of names believe that the capex cycle which is still underway is a function of both green and brownfield and that would lead to operating leverage going ahead as well but uh, with that it's time for the first break that we take on our show we have a big announcement as we do that we're launching CNBC TV 18's first ever live personal finance webinar it's called CNBC TV 18 accelerate personal finance handbook it's with Sonia Shinoy where she will be joined by three well known experts on Saturday 11th May 9 a.m onwards we'll be diving into everything you need to know to master your finances and learn how to grow your wealth be it insurance tax saving managing your portfolio retirement planning there's so much to learn and lots to do whether you're in your 20s 30s or even 40s this live webinar is for you so we have limited seats don't miss this chance register now all the details on your screen there's a QR code that you need to scan or maybe log on to cnbctv18.com we hope to see you on the 11th of may Welcome back. Well, let's shift the focus now from hospitals to the FMCG space. ICICI Securities has come up with interesting insights on how it has how the sector has been performing lately with respect to both the listed versus the unlisted players. Mangalam, tell us about the analysis. Well, it's very interesting, you know, Ekta. Uh, that's largely because listed FMCG companies over the last few quarters have spoken about rising competitive intensity, tough operating environment, tough macros really to function in. So ICICI Securities did an analysis of the performance of both listed and unlisted FMCG players in the last few years and the re- results are very interesting. Of course, this is with the caveats such as size and specific 
SKUs, uh, etc., <coughs> and specific categories of companies. So if you look at on an aggregate average basis over the last three years, the CAGR unlisted players have outperformed listed players in the revenue growth by about 160 basis points. In FY22, this outperformance was about 330 basis points. And in FY23, it widened all the way up to nearly 700 basis points. Now, while listed companies saw revenue growth in high single digits, uh, closer to 9% in uh, between FY19 to FY23, the average revenue CAGR, the unlisted peers saw revenue growth of over 10% for the same period. Now, if you look at the trends in the FMCG internals, they're a little divergent. However, the outperformance has been largely in the home and personal care segment for FY23. If you look at it, HUL stop line grew by 16%. Uh, well, the same for unlisted play parts of PNG, which is again, the home and personal care business grew 26%. L'Oreal grew about 33%. And if you look at just the HPC vertical of H uh, HUL, it grew in upwards of 20%. So that is still lower than the unlisted peers. If you look at, uh, you know, the other uh, players like Kellogg's, Hershey's, Mars in uh, the FNB chocolate space, Tata Consumer and Nestle actually underperformed with 11 and 14% growth itself. The others did well, largely because of one smaller base and their premium category products with more urban penetration instead of uh, the other players that we're talking about out here. And Tata Consumer, of course, saw an impact of the pricing of some of its commodities as well. But in mass consumption categories like biscuits, listed players like Bechter's, ITC Food and Britannia did a lot better than Parley G with a growth of 5%. Britannia grew about 15% last year with ITC growing about 20%. What are the reasons for the same? ICICI Security says listed FNB players outperformed unlisted players largely due to increased distribution in the food and beverage space. There is higher competitive pressures at both the mass end and the premium end from digital first and D2C brands has led to the underperformance of listed home and personal care products, uh, including, you know, the likes of GCPL, Tata Consumer and Jyoti Labs are the stocks that there are top picks. Why do they like them? Because they believe that these are companies which are on a self-growth path as against looking at uh, the tough operating environment. So yes, the environment is tough, but in that as well, a lot of the unlisted players are doing a lot better than the listed players. And in the listed players, the ones who have their own growth paths charted out are the ones which are outperforming and that's why they are the top picks. Okay, all right. So an interesting take coming in on the entire FMCG space. Their top picks include uh, GCPL, Tata Consumer as well as Jyoti Labs. We'll take a short break, but up next, Pratish Mehta of Yes Securities will join in with some trading strategies. Stay tuned. Welcome back here watching us here on Halftime Report. The Nifty meandering around that 22 170 mark. Midcap's doing a lot better. We have 1,300 stocks advancing for about 1,000 stocks declining. Those lines, however, have been you know coming closer to each other towards uh, uh, in, in the first half of trade. So let's see where we go in the second half as well. The Nifty is uh, flirting around the 20-day moving average like we pointed out at the start of the show itself. 22 162 is where the Nifty 20-day uh, moving average is placed and that's largely because the Nifty Bank is unable to cross past that 20-day moving average. And that will be extremely crucial to track today because it is the Nifty Bank expiry that takes place today. And this is for all the options for this week and the month of March itself. 47,000 call on the Nifty Bank, extremely active. That's telling you that the bears believe that, you know, 47,000 mark alongside the 20-day moving average on the Nifty Bank will be an important, crucial resistance. However, at the lower levels, very close to where we are on the Nifty Bank, 46,700 is an extremely active put. So telling you 46,650 to 46,700, uh, which is about 100 points from where we are right now, where is where the support <coughs> lies on the Nifty Bank. For the Nifty itself, 22,100 put has been extremely active, telling you that levels closer to 22,050 would be an important support. And these are for options that expire tomorrow. And the 22,150 call, surprisingly, has been equally active as well. They have a premium of almost 90 rupees. So telling you levels upwards of 20 to 250, which is a level that Gotham uh, Shah this morning also spoke about and being a resistance is likely to play out today. So let's watch about, uh, let's let's talk about individual stocks which are in focus. Siemens, that's the one which is seeing a lot of long positions being added. We've seen a decent up move in names like ABB 
and uh, LNT. So Siemens is seeing some long positions being added in the CapEx infra space. And Z is the other one which may re-enter FNO ban after exiting FNO ban in yesterday's trading session itself. Okay, all right, Mangram, Mangram, thanks very much for that. So that's the entire FNO space. Let's get your market conversation now. We spoke to Gautam Shah, who's the founder and chief strategist, Goldilocks Premium Research, to get his outlook on the market, top sectors and stocks to look at. Also on why he is so bullish on some PSU metal names. Listen in. I think make no mistake, this market has been in consolidation for, uh, phase for almost three months now. You know, we started the new year at a level of 20, 21,800. And as we speak, we are at 21, 22,000. So three months have passed and the Nifty continues to be around the same level. I think uh, ditto for the bank Nifty. So clearly this is a very healthy pause that the markets have seen after the kind of run-up that we saw in November and December of last year. And there has been divergent moves on the indices and in, in the market in general, because the top 300 stocks seem to be going through a time correction, whereas anything lower, you know, the balanced 1500 stocks seem to have gone through a 15% correction collectively. So if you actually study the market breadth, this market has seen a very large uh, correction internally, which does not show up on the technical studies. But I do believe that this consolidation is healthy and this is going to continue for some more time. I think the range is very clear in the form of 21,850 on the downside and 22,250 on the upside. Until we actually don't move past this zone, I don't think you're going to see anything special. So it's, it's almost like a pendulum with a few good days, a few bad days. And I think this is going to continue. But this is still a very theme-specific, sector-specific, stock-specific market. The medium-term, long-term bull trend continues. The liquidity factor remains. India's All of India's positives remains. It's just that this pause needs a little more time to resolve itself before we can start turning up again. So if indeed uh, the Nifty is going to punch through this broad consolidation, 500-600 point consolidation, then uh, which are the heavy hitters? Because none of them are consistently adding up. Uh, you, know, you know, one week it's Reliance, the other week is a little bit of a flare up in IT. Banks continue to sulk, barring the odd, you know, one odd good day. So where are the heavy hitters? Uh, that's quite true, Surabhi, because you don't have too many uh, stocks that are leading this market higher, which has been the problem in the last couple of weeks. You know, in the month of December, you had a scenario wherein all the three big boys, IT, Reliance and Banks, did well. And that's probably the reason the Nifty gradually moved to levels of 22,000 and beyond. Now, if you look at the last one month, what you'll realize is that it's just the burden on Reliance, you know, to keep this market safe. And that stock continues to trade around 2,900. But banks have come off in the last 15 days and SDFC does not perform, does not outperform. And that's not helping the entire market. And the IT index in the last one week, I think the move has been quite discouraging. So given this setup and given the fact that you don't have too many big boys batting for the bulls, I, I don't think it's going to be easy for the markets to actually get past that 22,250 number. So I think we are going to stay in this range for some time. Uh, and the bigger opportunity could be in the small caps and mid caps because that's where the big fall happened and that's where I think things could have stabilized. Uh, so those 1500 stocks, you know, you started off the conversation by breaking the market into the top 300 stocks which are in a range and consolidating and the bottom 1500 or, you know, the X of those 300 stocks where we have seen a price correction of about 15-20%. You believe that is done and what is the opportunity? Can you name some stocks where you think perhaps we've put in a bottom and there is upside from here? Uh, Rima, it's actually quite unique that the market does, uh, you know, things which are completely out of the box because you have a 2% correction on the Nifty and you have a 12% correction on the small cap index. I mean, that's the kind of uh, disconnect that we've seen in the recent past. But as I said, if you really run through a set of, say, 500, 700 stocks, you'll see that most of them have lost anywhere between 20 to 40%. So I think the cleanup has happened and you had a scenario where grade C and grade D stocks had started to do well and, and were being justified at any price. That that phase is gone. The men have been separated from the boys. And I think quality mid caps and quality small caps will come back strongly. I mean, I don't want to give you names here, but some of the auto ancillary names, some of the stocks in the hotel space, uh, you know, some of the infra stocks, I think they all look very good. But in terms of overall sectors, I think our preference remains in the form of pharma and, and uh, metals. I think these are the two spaces which we feel could outperform over the next three to six months. Okay, all right. In metals, you want to share any names or you want to split it up between ferrous, non-ferrous? 
Uh, I would actually go with the entire space because the way the charts are, I do see a 20% move on the metals index over the next uh, 6 to 12 months. So that's sizable. And within the metal space, I think the two PSUs which really stand out for us are Nalco and Sale. And I think both these stocks have the potential to register super normal gains this year. Mm, you know, since it's so positive, Gautam, on uh, metals, I wanted your view on copper. You know, over here, Hindustan copper, fundamentally things look stretched. But the key trigger is if copper prices are going to move up from here, that's the only pure play copper uh, play here in India. Uh, so how would you play it? I mean, what are the levels you're looking at on copper itself? See, when you talk about metals, you have to look at the China factor. And what I'm told is that uh, the return of China in some sense, I think, could be responsible for what happens to the world going forward and what happens to the metal space. I mean, I'm not a fundamental analyst. I go, I don't go into this in detail, but my yes. analysts tell me that that could be an important factor. And Hindustan Copper, as you rightly said, I think it's it's a, pro, a pure play, a copper play. And I think there is a lot more to come. See, please understand stocks like Nalco, Sale, Hindustan Copper have been underperformers or non-performers for years. And now they are finding their footing. You know what happened to many of the PSU stocks? They did nothing for about seven, eight years. And when the trend picked up, you don't start looking at valuations immediately. So I think they're going to be stretched. And if the China comeback does happen, which is what it looks like, then I think metal stocks could be beneficial. Okay, all right. Let's get in a technical call now. Pratesh Mehta of Yes Securities joins in. Pratesh, hi, welcome to the show. It's a stable day for the markets. All of the indices are in the green as we speak. The Sensex Nifty mid-cap index as well as the Bank Nifty. Advanced decline ratio is even keel. Um, more on the advancing side. How would you approach today? See, for next few weeks, I think it's right time to focus on the mid-caps. So we were of the opinion since the start of the month of Feb that we need to focus on the large caps and mid-caps which correct and underperform. But I think the when you look at the ratio of mid-cap versus Nifty, it is reversing of support zone. So I believe that mid-caps could be the focus of the next few months. And when you look at the seasonality for the, of the, for the month of April, of the last 10 years, the average return is 3.6%. So I think the April could be the month for mid-caps to outperform. All right. And uh, what kind of mid-caps are you looking at if we had to zero down on a couple of stocks? So, you know, uh, there are various categories, you know, first of all, we need to look at, uh, you know, the metal space. We need to look at the auto space. Uh, they are going to throw up opportunities. So when I talk about metals, you know, something like sale, uh, you know, uh, it comes up to, to my list. The stock has gone through a bit of correction lately and now has come back uh, and has given up a bullish total breakout of the upside. I'm expecting a move towards, you know, 150 to 154, at least in the next few weeks. The support would be around 124. And the uh, second stock that has got our attention from the, uh, that, that, would, would, uh, that would be from the auto basket. You know, uh, something like uh, TVS Motors looks very interesting. You know, th this stock uh, was an outperformer, took a pause, but again, resuming trend on the upside. So from here on, we can see the levels of 2400, 2450. That is the minimum target on the upside for this stock. And the stop loss would be around uh, 2010. Would you have a view on uh, Tata Chem? I mean, it saw a big parabolic move uh, in the week where there were hopes of Tata Sun's listing and then after that, saw a big decline. And now it seemed to be picking up some pace as well. This week, it's up around 6.5%. Uh, anything that explains you know, this sort of move? So, you know, uh, we have created several customized indices with chemical space, you know, organic, inorganic and several things. But Tata Chemical, you know, uh, it, it, it seems, seems to be the odd one out. It is not participate in any of the rally. It is it, We have seen in other indices. Uh, but, you know, rather than looking at Tata Chemical, there are several opportun opportunities in something like Nervin Fluorine. Uh, uh, this stock can do well from here on. Apart from that, SRF, it looks it is trying to break a multiple consolidation zone. So, I think rather than focus on Tata Chemical, something like SRF and, you know, Nervin Fluorine provide good opportunity of 10 to 50 percent of the upside from the chemical space. Okay. All right, Pratesh, we're going to let you go on that note. Thanks very much for joining in and giving us all of that perspective on the technicals of the market. Just want to point out that there are a couple of stocks which are managing to do very well today. So, for example, we have Torrent Power, which is at a fresh 52-week high, giving it companies Bajaj Auto, which is at a fresh 52-week high, along with Indigo as well. So, all of these stocks managing to make fresh highs. We'll take a short break. On the other side, however, it's an interesting conversation lined up. We'll get chatting with Abhijit Roy, who's the MD and CEO of Berger Paints, to discuss uh, the sector outlook after Birla Opus has announced prices for its paints foray.
Welcome back. Over the last month or so, we've been speaking about the paint industry ad nauseum. We've spoken to listed players. We've spoken to, uh, you know, existing players, new disruptors. Everyone was waiting for just one thing, the way the new entrant will, uh, you know, price their products. And now we have that as well. Uh, the House of Birlas has actually announced their price for the paints for a largely priced at a 5% discount to the industry. And they've also said that they will give additional 10% quantity across SKUs to the dealers, which implies that their pricing would be around 15 to 17% lower than the existing players. What exactly does that mean in terms of an impact for the existing players? What is uh, the preps at the house of all the other players like uh, at right now? We have uh, the management of Berger Paints joining in to discuss all of that. Abhijit Roy joins in. Abhijit, this is not the first time we've spoken about competition and you've always said that you're prepared for all sorts of uh, things that the competition has to throw up. But now that all the cards are on the table, the products are in the market as well, what's your reading of the space right now? I mean, how do you expect the scenario to go forward? So I think, you know, it's still, you know, a work in progress, I would say. But as of now, whatever we have seen, uh, we are cautious, but not worried. You know, I would place it in that manner. Uh, we need to keep watching this space, you know, more closely. But whatever so far we have seen, they have introduced certain products. Uh, we have tested those products. You know, the quality of it is quite similar to what we have already in the marketplace. Uh, nothing spectacularly different there uh, or nothing different at all, in fact. Uh, so it is more or less on, at par quality. The pricing that we have seen, you know, from the leader, you know, it is 5% lower uh, except for luxury category uh, in which, you know, it is priced at par with the leader. So we also operate at prices which are about 4 to 5% below the leader. So it's matched to our prices almost. So from the pricing perspective, therefore, to the dealer, there is no great difference. Yes, they are giving a consumer offer, which is about 10%, which you mentioned, uh, which is there for the customers per se. Now, customers, you know, they uh, this has been tried and attempted in the paint industry earlier as well. Uh, the problem is that the customers want the best quality product. You know, they don't want a 5, 7, 10% price off uh, in terms of pricing. Uh, they, they are interested in getting a good quality product applied properly uh, and available at the right place. So these have to be ensured, you know, for us, you know, for any company to gain, you know, it is not so much uh, the pricing part of it, because if that was the case, you know, we as we have operated at a lower price than the leader and other players have operated in many cases even below us in many many of the product categories but that hasn't changed the dynamics you know in the industry uh, to just to give you an example you know uh, in uttar pradesh uh, there are four cities very close to each other ayodhya and lucknow uh, kanpur and allahabad now if you look at it in ayodhya and lucknow we are the leaders you know bajar is the leader in these two markets and in Kanpur and Allahabad, you know, Asian Paints is the leader. And in both the cases, you know, we have about 40 to 50 percent market share in these two markets. And in their case, also they have 50 percent plus market share in, in the other two markets. Now, this has been for many years, this has been going on. You know, Asian Paints do not lack, you know, product quality or, you know, advertisement muscle power or for that matter, you know, uh, knowledge of the paint industry. And, uh, excellent quality people all around. So it's still that, you know, there is a difference in, in terms of the percentages. In paint industry, the changes are slow and incremental. It is not like you bomb and, you know, you flatten the surface and, you know, then you become the leader suddenly. It is one-on-one -on -one fight at every place, uh, which is, you know, time-taking. And that's why you know, we are, we are, you know, of course, you know, cautious, but we're not worried. Okay. All right. That point is taken. Um, and that's an excellent explanation of how it is. It's probably sticky and it's probably more at the ground level in terms of a fight. But uh, Abhishek just wanted to understand that uh, would you want to take another price cut in order to ensure your market share remains where it is? No, we, we, we will not, you know, get into that game, you know, of, you know, trying to 
and any newcomer who comes in you know there have been other people who have come in and done the same thing in the past i don't see you know us reacting in that manner uh, wherever it is required you know suppose some product is doing well we will be focused on that particular product and we'll do something around it not necessarily price cut but we can do many other interesting things so we can react as and when required you know as of now it is too premature to say anything in fact their distribution will take some time you know it will probably be more towards you know the second half when the real battle will happen the first half you know i, I don't see you know anything uh, to be done you know which is different from what we have been doing so far you know what's interesting abhijit so far is that a lot of players who made their entry into the paints industry no one spoke <coughs> of the targets that uh, you know birlas have been speaking of in terms of aggression there's capacity there's revenue that they're speaking about 10000 crores they're speaking about the dealer channel that they are uh, looking to target as well 10000 the first 6 months they're after 50000 uh, do you think uh, it is possible to scale up that fast and if scale up happens at that pace the disruption that you might face would be different from what you've faced so far so you know uh, you can say that the scale of the effort is itself you know at a different level it is definitely mm -hmm. a bigger scale right you know no one has attempted this in this way you know so far right you know as a newcomer but you know as i said the industry and, and it is not only in india it is worldwide that it takes time you know incremental steps have to be taken it doesn't happen like in a burst unless you know the existing players make some mistakes so in my opinion therefore it will be a slow grinding process you know it will not be as fast as possibly anticipated uh, it might be lesser than what you know the projections have been given uh, i i don't think it is impossible to achieve those targets but it is highly improbable that the targets will be hit okay what about your business uh, because in the quarter gone by year to date your volume growth was 10.9% market share 20% your gross margins were at a 10 quarter high uh would you expect all of this sustaining in the coming quarters what is the guidance that you can provide us given the competitive scenario so you know in in terms of our growth rate you know with the launch uh, you know probably we were growing on an average on an you know if you look at the cagr the value growth has been around 14 odd percentage the volume growth has been around 12 odd percentage this has been last 25 year i would say cagr if you look at it now this year uh, we expect that with increased competition this 12% volume growth may become 11% volume growth sort of not beyond that as as of this year right because first 6 months we have no issues and in you know, the next 6 months there might be one or 2% you know hit in the overall volume growth that we have so it will be approximately around a double digit volume growth of about 11 odd percentage a value growth which will be about 3% below that because you know there is a price decrease which has happened which will has been passed on to consumers so that you know it will become about 8 to 9% of uh, value growth which is likely to happen so this is i would say volume value profitability will be more or less you know i have given a range between 15% to 18% is where we operate in terms of ebitda uh, to sales ratio uh, we will be probably around the 16 16.5% range uh, currently it is slightly higher than that you know but you know we have uh, taken some sort of a price decreases as well so it will impact and it will come down to that healthy level but you know it will be slightly lower than what we had been registering last year All right, and final question before we let you go since you said that you know volumes won't be impacted by more than 1% at least in the next one year and there have been price cuts. Uh, the worry that a lot of analysts have is that there won't be a lot of margin upside triggers for the industry going forward. That's largely because one the raw material deflation has more or less played out. You guys will have to now, you know, uh, cut prices for you to actually spur up demand going forward and with competition coming in, be that as it may, ad spends of the industry or some sort of dealer margins that you would give etc may increase as well so would that be a fair assessment that at least for the near term margins for the industry would be in a range may not see as much an upside so we we have always been in this range uh, you know between the 15 to the 18% uh, 
when the raw material prices drop and, and and there is you know extra profit to be made by the industry at as large you know our uh, profitability tends to move upwards to 17 and a half 18 and and then you know when it is squeezed in the other way it comes down to around 15 odd percentage we operate in that band and we will continue to operate in that particular band there is no major change that you know is anticipated you know minor uh, changes might happen but i don't see any major change happening there Right, take that point. Thanks a lot, Abhijit, for joining in. Always a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, you said it as uh, you could. You were cautious about them, but not worried about them. And it's highly improbable uh, that the targets by uh, you know set out by competition will be met over the next three years. Uh, you will continue to maintain your leadership in the places that you are. Uh, wish you good luck for the quarter. Also, we'll speak to you post your numbers. With that, we'll take a short break. On the other side, Manisha Gupta joins in with R.K. Janamani, who's a senior scientist at IMD. He'll talk all things weather. Stay tuned. Welcome back and IMD has predicted above normal monsoon temperatures, above normal temperatures rather for the summer season. We are now joined by Mr. R.K. Janamani, he's senior scientist, India Meteorological Department. Mr. Janamani, hi, I first of all want to talk about the heat wave that a lot of people seem to be talking about. And there is, uh, there has been this warning statement from IMD talking about above normal temperatures. How are we looking at the month of April now going forward? The April IMD has not published, but if we see, uh, you know, days I had say for next five days, so mm. there has been temperature already, you know, reached 41 degrees. So we have few station who has already reported a, you know, 41 plus uh, like Bhuj, and then we have also uh, like Akola, this Vidarbha and Madhya Maharashtra Marathwada area. There uh, was in Rajkot, uh, in Gujarat. Now, some of the station even uh, 40 plus also Karnataka. So a lot of station 40 uh, in the peninsula and also 41 plus over Maharashtra and Gujarat. So we have given also first time in this season uh, that there will be a temporary heat wave trail for uh, uh, Saurashtra and Kach and also interior parts of Maharashtra for uh, the next two days only. But good, good news is that we have back-to-back -back western disturbance, so temperature has been able to control actually if we uh, look at... Uh, uh, you know, 22 and 23, we know how the temperature was. 2022, we had a very early summer and a heat wave, but 2023, we had a lot of mm. thunderstorm. And 2024 is also, you know, till today, things are okay. And mm. uh, not uh, temperature are not, uh, you know, uh, picking up. So when you will have a, you know, we have predicted rain right over the, uh, you know, Uttar Pradesh and then uh, North Rajasthan, uh, all along the uh, Northwest Plains and, of course, uh, significant rain snow will be there for next five days. So it shows that temperature is under the control, but we are monitoring. As I told for the Gujarat and Maharashtra, Telangana, there are issues, uh, they are touching the 41 plus. Oh, well, yes, absolutely. Um, actually, Mr. Janamani, Mumbai as well in the in, in the previous yeah, week itself. Yeah, it, yeah. 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 <laughs> yes. and, uh, 38 degrees. Are, yeah. yeah, hot and humid we are also giving for the Kumpan for next two to three days, that uh, there is anti-cyclone, and that's why all Maharashtra, Karnataka is in the higher temperature zone of 40, 41, but Konkan, Goa has a high humidity and 36, 37 plus also. Yeah. Mm. yeah some Mr. Janavani, for the month of... Go, for the yeah, month of really March, uh, these abnormal uh, high-level temperatures, I mean, how much are we higher than average right now? Yeah, we have not got a month end, but what I already told that we have a lot of uh, good uh, thunderstorm activity. Northwest mm. India, I don't think anything will be there or even most part of India, because as you know that continuously this East UP, Bihar, Jharkhand, Odisha, Bengal, they were lowest, uh, you know, almost 30 years lowest recorded on 21 March and subsequently also till today less than normal. So one part is that uh, I can tell that northern indo gangetic plains right up to Odisha, Bihar, Jharkhand, they are much below normal till today. So it is good to see that temperature is in the colder condition, but as I told that some part of Gujarat, Maharashtra picking up. But nothing, you know, like uh, anything 2022 is not comparable. We are not uh, getting a high temperature till today. So our official forecast will come within next three to four days for the April, what will be the condition, and subsequently by mid-April we will get the monsoon forecast also. 
so mm-hmm. that too, we will be able to address all the you know issues uh, you know long sectorial plan and other things uh, like your channel they also do mm-hmm. yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, there also is a, a report from uh, IMD talking about uh, perhaps uh, weather disturbance, uh, western weather disturbance that is, and rainfall in Punjab and Haryana as well. There also is a yellow alert for next two or three days. What can be expected for these states? Yeah, that I already told. We are getting, you know, back-to-back western disturbance already Delhi is clouding today. And uh, already the part of northwest India, some drizzle has been there. And it will pick up and the western disturbance will be most active on 28 and 29 up to 50th of this month. So so there will be cool weather and mainly rain snow in the higher reaches, as you know, uh, still the delayed. It was started, but it is continuing, particularly in Machal and uh, Jammu Kashmir. We have given also orange color warning for uh, 28 and 29 also because of this, you know, rain and snow. So so this is the status. I don't think any Northwest India, anything for next one week, any heat wave or any high temperature. They still need to be cooler than the normal, yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Hmm. Thanks a lot for joining in, uh, Mr. Janamani, and uh, speaking about uh, you know the weather situation. Manisha, thank you so much for taking us through this. Uh, what we get so far is that uh, we have to brace ourselves for a very hot summer. 38 degrees already in Mumbai, which is 6 degrees higher than what you see in March. So, But he says that another 2 to 3 days and we perhaps would be in a better space. But until then, yes. Let's hope uh, that happens. Uh, <laughs> until then, uh, we'll take a short break. And as we do that, uh, some good news that we'd like to share with you. Money Control has further strengthened its position as India's premier business news platform, beating economic times across key metrics. According to Comscore data for the month of February, Money Control has the largest number of unique visitors. It also has maintained its massive lead in page views and time spent. We'd like to take this opportunity to thank no one but you, our viewers and readers for reposing your faith in Money Control and Network 18. Market continues to move higher right now. Honeywell from the broader markets has moved to the high point of trade. We're seeing decent traction in names like Tata Chem and Indian Hotels, United Spirits and India Cements as well. It's about the broader markets, but the frontline index too holding up and above the 20-day moving average, led higher by Reliance, which has moved to the high point of trade an inch closer to that 3,000 mark. With that, it's uh, curtains down on this edition of Halftime Report. Stay tuned. Business Lunch comes up next.